Well, I'm very happy to be here this afternoon. I would like to start uh, first with two movements. Um, just to is the physical movement to to open our heart and the and the energy in the body. So what we will do is first this first exercise. Maybe you wanted to take you know your pen and book. Just leave it aside for a moment. So you breathe in and you hold your breath in your heart area. And you will bring your hands down here and then we'll do like this. Just don't punch somebody. <laughs> and we'll do this movement five times. You're holding your breath. And then with the other hand, you will do five times. You're continuously holding your breath and come down and and you move like this upward. Your right chest, you open five times. You're continuously holding your breath. <laughs> and then you move the other side five times. You're continuously holding your breath. If you feel like it's too long, you can do fewer times or faster. OK? So, so what, just, just trying to be here in this moment and just whatever uh, circumstances, situation is in your life, challenges, how you're happy, you're, or facing challenges, whatever it is, just forget everything for a moment. Just be here and just draw your atten full attention to your heart and do this movement. And then in the end of this movement, you, you just breathe it out. And as you breathe it out, you will feel a sense of release, energy, uh, kind of release of energy, uh, blockages. And when you feel that, what you do is just simply rest in that opening space and right here in the heart. Okay, so we'll do this three times. You can sit straight. Breathe in, deep, and hold in the heart chakra. As you breathe out, you feel a physically opening, energetically opening, and mentally opening, some sense of deep op opening, and just simply rest effortlessly as you draw your attention in your heart. Once again, breathe in. Same. Be aware of the sense of physical, energetic, and mental opening, and gradually rest in that openness as you maintain your attention, effortless attention in your heart. One last time.
just feel there's more sense of opening of heart chakra. Just rest and be aware of that openness. The second exercise what we're going to do is uh, it's called pervasive prana, pervasive wind exercise. So you breathe in and then you, you open your hand like this. You breathe in and then you hold your breath, your hip like this, and then you, it's like massaging yourself while, while you're holding your breath. To all your body, just in your feet and then come here, and then you shoot like an arrow. Well, as you're shooting arrow, like, look in the, five times. And five times the other direction, okay? And then you, as you breathe out, you will feel this like a sensation all your body, like some sense a little bit kind of opening sensation all your body, and just breathe it out and just rest and be aware of this feeling that you're feeling in your body. Okay, so we will do it three times. again. One last time. So maintain your clear and open attention to your body. Feel this feeling of opening, openness, and just simply maintain attention there and rest. But be fully aware. Okay, short meditation. <laughs> so we have a very short time, we're like one hour, and so I just want to say briefly a little bit about both books. And so these two exercises we just did, it's from uh, Awakening the Sacred Body book. It is the five uh, principal exercises. These exercises are uh, very much based on uh, chakras in the body, energy centers in the body. And this is, 
it's not only a physical exercise, but it is very much like a, to o open the energy field and also to open all the psychological dimension, spiritual dimension. So the, this is like a f much, much more than the uh, physical practices. You know, I mean, I see uh, <laughs> walking in the street here, everybody walking with a yoga, yoga mat and so on. Uh, and some, so some, sometime where I look at in the West is people are very much focused on, on the physical part, and which is nothing wrong about it, of course. It's, it's important to do. But the, in the ancient tradition, like, like traditions like Indian traditions and Tibetan traditions, these practices are coming from thousands of years. They're coming down. And, and the original purpose was this practice was not just the body. There was very much the body. It was the small part of it. So what the most important part of this exercise was to open more a psychological and a spiritual dimension. Basically, basically uh, in the end, is, of course, in the Buddhism, it says in the end, it's to achieve illumination, to liberation. Okay, maybe that's too far away. So maybe let's forget about the liberation, full liberation. But at least if we can all think about in the end, what, what the purpose of these practices should be is to be, be happy in a life, to be uh, clear in life, to be uh, doubtless in one's life, to be a more, more be positive in one's life. So some sense of well-being uh, in, in a psychological and a spiritual well-being. So that well-being, a fit physical body does not mean well-being. You can see a lot of a fit physical body with a lot of messy psychological states. So, so that it does not always go together. So it's very important to kind of recognize that the body is a very important part, but each time, each exercise leads into a higher state of consciousness. Uh, for that, I mean, that's every, almost every exercise, that's the purpose of it. So if you're doing any exercise, maybe you also wanted to ask, okay, what about this particular exercise, what, what I'm supposed to feel? What kind of energy is supposed to open in me? What kind of blockage is supposed to clear? What kind of psychological, new psychological state awareness it's supposed to bring? What kind of, you know, old meditative experiences supposed to bring? So it's, these are the important questions one should ask. So, um, of course, you don't have to ask right the first time when you're doing the yoga, but eventually you wanted to ask that. Just uh, There are people who are doing many, many years of yoga and never ask that question, and just yoga is just purely like a physical thing. That's a sad story. So, and for example, this particular two exercise which we just did, for example, so the first one we, we did was, it's called a life force, life force tunnel exercise. So the idea of this exercise is also in the ancient time, we believe it's a longevity practice. A practice, in some sense, it has a cardio exercise. If you think of the modern, modern uh, situation, it's a kind of cardio exercise. And um, so it believes like this exercise would have a, a, a power to a clear a blockages in the heart, a power to clear like emotion blockages so that if it's some, in, in a sense of relationship, if you're having with somebody, that whatever emotional relationship uh, there is, there, these blockages can be cleared. Or whatever obsessive thoughts that you have in your, in your mind, they can be cleared. So in the end, or even there's some sense of pain, they can be clear. So when you clear them, in the end, as I said in the meditation here, you know, just being aware of that sensation of opening and openness, for example. Opening is kind of a process that you feel. But I mean, gradually, if you rest in there, and you don't feel necessarily kind of opening, but you feel like more, just kind of naturally there is openness, which is kind of the nature of yourself. So when you connect with that, it, that is in a way, the whole purpose of whole exercise is to bring you that experience. But the most of the time when people do exercise, they say, oh, I feel great with this exercise. That means I, I do the exercise, I feel great, and then I'm ready to mess up something else. You know, <laughs> so it's to, to, to feel great to mess up something. So that is not the purpose. When you, when you feel great, to recognize that feeling great and become more familiar because so the openness in the heart will be a state of meditation. Like that could be called a meditation of emptiness. 
a meditation of openness or meditation of nature of mind, a meditation of a true self, meditation of nowness, this very moment. But that experience can be very much uh, experienced through this exercise. For example, some people might try to meditate, they might have a very hard time to meditate and have the experiences of being still, for example. But doing exercise three times, it will bring very powerfully bring in that state. So so idea of like a awakening the sacred body will be each of these exercises bringing very specific state of a mind. So that's the whole idea. So I think just to say a sacred body it's referring to uh, not only a physical body, but sacred body is referring to eternal, changeless body. So that is the sacred body. And the other book, uh, The Awakening of the Luminous Mind, is there's no physical exercise in, in that. That is very much, it's a very ancient meditation called Dzogchen meditation, or it's called, also called uh, Great Perfection or Great Completeness. And this Great com- Perfection and great completeness is referring to one's own human nature, you know, our nature, our true self. It, that is what is referring to. So, for example, every sentient being in Buddhism believes that every sentient being in everybody, you have a Buddha nature. You can say Buddha nature, you can call, say Christ nature, whatever you can say, your true nature, that every sentient being, we have that state in ourselves every given moment. Right now, for example, you all have that state of enlightened state of mind, the Buddhahood that's in you. And so to access that, there is a whole philosophical tradition, hundreds of books, uh, uh, thousands of unbroken transmission and lineage coming down, unbroken. Uh, the explaining uh, in, in giving instruction and introducing that state of mind. So that is, in a way, the reason why I kept this book very simple is just, you know, uh, nobody seems like I have any more time. You know, everybody says, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, right? I'm busy to meditate, I'm busy to do a yoga, I'm busy to feel good. But nobody is busy enough to feel, you know, I'm, nobody says, I'm busy, I, I don't have feel. Uh, I say, I'm, 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 I'm busy, I don't want her to feel doubt. I, I'm busy, I don't want her to feel bad. No. For feeling bad, everybody has time. <laughs> For feeling doubt, everybody has a time. And they, they can say, where well, you can feel bad? I can feel bad anywhere. <laughs> in a restroom, in the driving, in the street, while talking with somebody, while not talking with somebody, by being alone, I can feel anywhere, any situation. So that's... That's what it is. Our, that's our nature. So somehow, these, these awakening the luminous mind practices is based on three principles. I just kind of, something that all of you will remember is what I also call three pills. Everybody remembers three pills, right? Because everybody takes many pills. So the first pill is, the, is a modern metaphor for ancient practices. First pill is called white pill because it's related with the body and what it means is, means experience of stillness. For example, right now, this very moment, as you're listening to me, if you also draw a little attention to your body, as I'm speaking, I'm doing the same thing. So as you draw your attention to your body, your body is still, right? Can you feel that? That stillness, of your body, it's one pill. It's called white pill. The color white is associated with the body in our tradition. And second pill is the red pill. As I'm speaking, even I'm speaking, I can, when I draw my attention to my inner speech, I can hear the silence, for example. I'm speaking, I'm drawing attention to my inner speech, I can hear Silence. As you're listening to me, if you draw attention to inside yourself, you can also hear silence as much as you hear me talking, for example. But when you lose that connection to inner silence, we disconnect ourselves. When we lose that connection to the inner stillness, we disconnect ourselves. So the third pill is, it's a blue pill. It's related with the mind. 
And that is what I call spaciousness or openness. Okay? So if you, this very moment, if you draw attention to your heart area with the, ex, the exercise that we just did, uh, you felt sense of opening, openness. If you, that's still there. If you draw attention to that, it's still there. If you lose the connection, you lose the connection. So, so if you draw attention there, you feel that spaciousness. So stillness, white pill, silent, red pill, spaciousness, blue pill. Stillness related with the body, silence related with the speech, spaciousness related with the mind. And they are related with, it's called, also called three doors. Door of the body, door of the speech, door of the mind. And these doors are yours, within you, right? I'm just explaining, trying to explain something that what, when you look inside yourself, you just feel it there. It's just right there. For example, just I, I, I recommend everybody just you draw attention right right this moment. That stillness is there, but you you're trying to feel that through your body. It's there, but when you draw attention, when you're aware of it, it's dramatically experience changes. It changes, it becomes much more powerful. It's there, but if you're not aware of it's there, it is, there's no effect, there's not so much effect. So the, the main point here, it's more important to be aware than just being still. I mean, we are all, everybody is still right now, but you are not necessarily aware of it. So, you be aware of that. For example, silence, same thing. I'm the only one talking here. Everybody is silent. But, if you don't hear it, it's not very powerful. If you listen to that silence, You hear it, you feel it. Very strong sense of present there. One time I remember my own experience while I was traveling in Mexico, there was a lot of people around me and you know, like, there was a lot of confusions going around me and uh, I was kind of part of it. And suddenly I said, I need to, to hear sign and not all these people here. I draw attention inside. The silence was so powerful there. I was so amazed how powerful, how distinctive from that circumstances it and my inner silence was. And it was for the sake of the fun, I went out trying to listen to all this noise around me. I could hear it. Not much interesting. I went in, I could hear it. So it's very much it's a question about being aware of it. Third, the spaciousness. Of course, the more, very important part of the spaciousness is you're just trying to be in the moment, in the present. You're trying to feel first a pill and the second pill or the first door and the second door will help the mind because the mind is very, very complicated. Much more, you know, much more than the body. In the Buddhism, we say, you know, if you go out in a shopping, you, if you see a nice cloth, Mind buys everything, or a lot of things. The speech, you don't ask prices for everything, right? A fewer. And in a physically, maybe you might not buy anything. You might buy one. Mind buys everything, speech buys less, the, the body buys very low. It means the body can be more controlled, the speech can be more controlled. Mind, it's harder to control. But if the body and the mind, I say the speech, if your stillness and the silence is more together there, it's very easy or easier to feel that spaciousness. So why it's important to experience these three pills and the three doors? Because if you look in everyday life, that if you say, let's say uh, in your life, if you any challenges you're facing, 
emotional challenges, physical challenges, health challenges, relation challenges. If you see whatever challenges you're facing, you're basically facing a kind of pain that you're facing. It's your inner pain. And one of the reasons why this inner pain, it's very hard to heal, it's very repetitive in our life. Because it's very habitual. And sometimes you don't need a good reason to be feeling pain. You get up in the morning, you say, I've been whole week, wonderful, feeling good. It's a time to feel bad. <laughs> and you look at it around, you say, today is the time. You know? Then you look around, how I'm cre- I have to create a good story. So you're looking around and you can see sometimes people like that. They're looking for a story. <laughs> when, you, when I see them, I run away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're looking for it. They'll look, they'll look, they'll look, and finally they will find one. And they make a great story out of it. But you don't need to do that. So one of the reasons why it's very important in these practices is, is I, I say that the way we treat ourselves, the way we treat our pain, we, we treat our pain terribly bad. Just imagine... When your, your best friend comes to you and asks, it's in a big trouble, it's in a lot of pain, and comes to you, what do you do? Your best friend comes to you in a really like a pain and deep pain, big trouble, and comes to you seeking for help, what do you do? You will not judge that person, right? You will not say, oh, why did you mess up in the begin- first place? <laughs> Would you say that? If you said that, you're not best friend then. What you will say in that moment, you will be completely open to that person. Completely open there. So, you know, your heart will be completely open. That's the third, third door we are talking about. Your speech, you won't be judging externally or internally. You, know, you won't be judging that person. You will give a hug, for example. During hug, you won't be checking your message behind the hug, right? Would you do that? You hug like this, you're checking your text message. seems like everybody does almost everywhere. But you want, that moment you weren't doing that. You will just simply hug. When you hug, do you have to move? No. You're just being very still. You're still, you're hugging. Your head is very silent. Your heart is very open. And when you do that, what does your friend feel? Just imagine what does your friend feel. Have you have, have you Treat it that way with your best friend when you were in trouble. Do you remember one? Just try and remember one. When you went, somebody was there fully present, not judging and criticizing you, not having specific expectations from you, but being completely available to you to help you. So do you treat, when you are, when you are in trouble in yourself, do you treat that way? No. You immediately judge yourself, right? You'll say, why did you mess up? You always mess up. You see, your speech is very active and alive and criticizing and judging and giving such a hard time to yourself. How many people do that? But you don't do that to your best friend, right? But you do that to yourself. So, so that, this is very important. Why we, so we have to kind of learn in order to awake the luminous mind, uh, in order to experience your true self, in order to uh, encounter the divine within, or the Buddha within, Christ within, what you have to do is first learn how to treat uh, properly yourself. And properly yourself particularly means whenever, when you, whenever you face challenges, whenever you're, you're feeling pain, that moment, that moment, very, very important. You look inward, be the best friend. That moment, be the best friend. That moment, you, what do you, how you can be the best friend? Be still. Be silent. Be spacious. And allow to feel whatever you're feeling. That if you're silent, you're allowing it to feel whatever you're feeling. If you're still, you're allowing it to feel whatever it's feeling. If you're spacious, if you're open, you're allowing it to whatever it to feel. And when you allow whatever it to feel, it feels in a very different way. It's like a, this, a free child, a free, a free person, a 
free motion. It's like expressing itself. And that very moment, incredible healing is taking place. That we don't do. So when you do that, so what, what I say is I'm like a prescription, you know. You, when, whenever you face challenges, you take three pills. Just remember that, three pills. Whenever you face challenge within yourself or whenever you face challenge by somebody, whenever you're challenged by somebody, right away, yes, you take three pills. Just the only thing you have to remember is three pills. Just that very moment, just be still. Sign it. Feel that spacious. A student of mine, she said, you know, she was uh, having uh, a difficult relationship with her sister. And uh, they, were, they don't see very often each other. And finally, they, they have to see each other because of the mother's getting old. They're, they have special gathering. So she has to bring her mother to her sister's place. And, um, she, and she was stuck in a traffic and she got late. And when she arrived there, and her sister was very angry because she, her sister thought, this is a very special gathering. We want everybody to be in time. She, she intentionally trying to be late so the mother can come late. She has all the stories in her head. And she, the moment she walks in, her sister yells at her. And when she, her sister yells at her, she remember, boom, three pills. Just 30 seconds. And she said, a thought came, and, and the voice came, and the voice was, to, she told her sister, you seem very stressed out. Do you want a shoulder massage? And her sister did not expect shoulder massage. <laughs> and her sister said, okay. <laughs> and they went in the side. She gave a little shoulder massage. That was the end of the story. She said, if I did not take three pills, I would scream louder than her, and I would have left the place. So three pills saved her relationship that very moment. So, of course, the three pills basically means, in our tradition, we call three doors. And I don't know, three door is uh, three pills. Thought, I thought it would be a good metaphor. So another thing to remember here is also reason why three pill or reason why three door or reason why these three experiences of stillness, silence, and spaciousness is because the way we hold our pain is also three ways. I call it pain body, pain speech, and pain mind. Pain body, for example, I also call it it's like a, a sitting on a rotten karmic cushion. Okay. Sitting on a rotten karmic cushion means basically that means sometimes you're alone, you're sitting by yourself, and do you feel very open? No. You, do you feel very clear? No. Do you feel inspired? No. What are you feeling? You are sitting on your rotten karmic cushion. You are sitting on your past story. Your body is in that pain. Your energy field is in that pain. You look at the face, you can see that. But you are not conscious of that identity, sitting on the, that old identity. So, when you're sitting on this, that old identity, you're not free. So what do you do? In that very moment, when you recognize you are sitting on rotten karmic cushion, or you are stuck in that your pain body, you're just trying to be aware. You be, be aware. The moment you are aware you are, you breathe. Just one single breath and one single awareness, it changes everything. For example, Monday morning, 9 o'clock Monday morning, a collective professional pain entire in the world. Just imagine, Monday morning, 9 o'clock, a professional collective pain. See, can you see, can you imagine that? Can you see yourself on Monday morning? Like that? Is it any yogic position? Is it a particular yoga, yogic breathing? No. It's pain. Who taught you? 
Why are you doing that so seriously? <laughs> you see? It, it, you don't have to do that. But how you would not do that if you're aware of it? The moment if you're aware of it, you release, you, you, you hold the steering gentler, you s relax your body more, you breathe deeper, and you drive. You arrive at the same place, maybe faster. Right? Or, I'd say another example would be a collective family Christmas, a distorted family having Christmas dinner together. That's the collective family pain body. Just imagine. Everybody, just imagine, every single person is just like, mm. he's going to say that, she's going to do that, and they're all kind of, kind of, kind of waiting for somebody to do something or not do something. They're supposed to have a, a nice, loving family dinner. But they are physically very caught, so they are in that pain body. Again, how you overcome, uh, maybe one family member can be conscious, oh, I am in that pain body right this moment. Just relax. Take three pills, three pills. Feel that stillness, feel that space, feel that openness. And then you see a different energy, different quality, different voice, different guidance will come from that. And the voice, what will come out there? It will be like a, a giving a massage. Somebody who yells at you, I mean, how many, uh, that's very creative, right? Somebody yells at you, and you have such a creative idea to give a shoulder massage to somebody. That's very creative. Just spontaneous. A new thought. That's not a pain thought. It's like a more open speech comes out from that place. So that is, that is like, a, uh, you see, so pain body. For pain speech, for example, same thing. How many times, okay, do you know somebody complains all the time? Do you know somebody complains all the time? Without any good reasons. Or maybe even no reasons. Yes? It's not you, right? <laughs> it's somebody. Of course, it's, you know, you always, you always, it's very clear to see somebody else doing that. It's very hard to see yourself doing that. But it's a, so powerful when you recognize. Of, a student of mine told me a story. She said she was getting this serious discussion with her husband, like almost fight. And suddenly she realized, wow, there's nothing serious, nothing real things to discuss here, me and my husband. This is just a Pure my inner discomfort, pain speech is just making something out. And the moment she recognized, she said she laughed out loud. She laughed and just give him a big hug and they just walked. That was the end of the story. There was no story. But she recognized that moment there was no story. But if you did not recognize, she would make a good story and then there will be a good story. Which was never, never there. So that's very important to remember whenever the way we sit, our position of our body or inner, inner identity, position of our physical body or position of our inner identity or whenever we, our thoughts are moving, whenever we, our speech is active, just kind of be aware of your, is it a pain speech or is it coming from that silence? Is this a pain body or it is this, a, a open being in that stillness? So these are very important. So, so three pill is very important. If, if the pain body is active, you take the white pill. If the pain speech is active, you take the red pill. If the pain mind is active, you take the blue pill. But you, when you take it, it brings you in a right place, in a deeper state, deeper experience state. OK. I think I'm going to stop here. So we will do a little practice with these three pills, OK? So we don't, uh, we're running out of time. So uh, just uh, sit comfortably. Just, just take a few deep breathing and just release whatever is here in your mind and thought. Just clear everything. Just forget everything, even what I said. 
Okay, just just be here. And you draw your attention to your body as your body is still, as our body is still, as there is a, a universal stillness. Just feel that. But maintain your attention more toward your body. As this room is very quiet, as you are in silence, just listen to inner silence. Feeling that stillness, hearing that silence. Just be aware of that spaciousness, that openness in your heart, like a crystal clear sky in the desert. being aware of that openness of the mind, hearing that silence of the speech, feeling that stillness in the body. If you are in that state this moment, you're stopping all the patterns, negative patterns, negative thoughts patterns, negative emotional patterns, negative addicted pain. You're clear this moment. If you stay longer in that stillness, in that silence, in that spaciousness, there will be new opening, deeper opening in your body, in your speech, in your mind. From that openness, new qualities will merge, like joy that sense of inner peace, inner worthiness, like love, compassion. Any quality meant to arise in a particular moment in your life or particular situations in your life, it knows 
what quality to merge more than your thought. You trust that. Through three doors, you arrive in that unbounded, sacred space and infinite awareness. Knowing of that unbounded, sacred space. That is like encountering a God. That is knowing your true self. That is, knowing your best inner friend. That is also like a knowing a child, reconnecting with a mother who has been lost for a long time. When you know that inner sacred space, in our unbounded sacred space through that three doors. It's like a reconnecting with that inner mother, inner divine, which is within you. Knowing that will help resolve all the conflicts of life. Rest for a moment in that space. Allow whatever qualities are emerging, allow it to nourish your inner being. So we will have uh, just maybe just few questions if, if anybody has. I would like to know if you can answer the question, what is the drive, what do we seek in attaching ourselves eternally to a story? <laughs> I'm not getting your question. Okay. Um, you talked early in your um, speech about we, we have a, almost like an addiction to stories. And if we stop listening to our story, the story will go, and then we don't manifest the story. What, 
Do you why? know the psychological or any other reason why we are so driven towards wanting to have a story? Well, uh, this example is they say when you roll a paper, like a roll paper, and leave it for 10 years like that, keeping it rolled, and when you're trying to open it, and, and you have to hold it in order to keep it open, when you don't hold it, what happens? Immediately goes back. Why? Because it has been that way for a very long time. So it's like a habit of repeating and being in that very long time, it automatically goes back. But it's so undoing it, it's like a gradually, there's incredible possible, possible changes you can do, but like what we are recommending here is simply just being aware, for example, when you are in that state physically, when you are, like when you are sitting alone and very much in that pain. You don't have to sit in that pain, right? Monday morning, 9 o'clock, professional pain body. You know, you get paid when you arrived at the work, not at the before. You know, that's not your job. Maybe after you get there, then you get in pain. Okay, at least you're getting paid for your pain. <laughs> so, Christmas dinner. You're supposed to be there being happy, family, you know, like at least intentionally you can do something good. You can make some changes. One, not if you can open, maybe it opens everybody else. There's an incredible possibilities there. But you, why we don't do that? Because we don't know we are doing what we're doing. So the first thing is important to know is that whenever you tune into that pain, body, speech, and mind, and the only thing is to do is just be aware, oh, I'm doing it. And the moment you're aware, just take a deep breath, and rather than reacting from that space, just deep, deep breathing. That's enough to start with. If you begin to do that, you will really begin to see changes. Because we have, I mean, in our, we have, I have designed something called 63 transformation, three door. Actually, it is called threedoor.org. So the idea is to I train my students. That their ancient time, people have to recite the mantras a lot. You say 100,000, this mantra, 100,000, the other mantra. I say, okay, now I don't want, in the, at least as this group, I said, don't want, I don't want you to recite the mantra. I want you to transform your life. 21 thing in your personal life, 21 thing in your family life, 21 thing in your professional life. Means you need to recognize your own blockages. You change them. How you change them? Every time you get into that pattern, be conscious. And of course, we have exercises we give, but the most important, more than the exercises, is to be aware of that. Okay? Yeah, sir. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to know when you come from uh, a country where there is serious crisis, collective pain, collective stories. I'm aware of this, and I try my best to, to be aware all the time, awakened to all this, and I try to help others. But when it becomes so, I come from Syria, where there is serious crisis now. So what, what to do now? I send messages, and I try to teach people how to get out in different ways, because I've you know, work so hard on myself to be awakened all the time. But how can I help? Nobody yeah. is listening, you know? Okay, so for example, no, your, your thought about nobody is listening, it's your pain speech. You know, everybody thinks the same way in the family, and when family people have problems, they say, I'm, I'm, I love my family, I want them to change their life, I want them to listen to me, I have a good advice, for example. So some sense of we all have, when we look inside, we kind of forget how we are relating to everybody else. As you exactly said, nobody is listening to me. But maybe that might be not true because there are people listening to you. But both you, you're, you're list, you, you feel more who is not listening than who is listening to you. And this happens all the time. People will say, well, if you say somebody, you're angry right now, they will say, I'm not angry. What do you mean I'm angry? You see, they will, their voice is high, their behavior changes, but they're still not recognizing, they will not admit or recognize they're angry. So it's very much like a sometime, you know, just, just to be conscious of that, you know. A student of mine, she said, she was, she was doing the practices in order to change her relationship with her mother. And so she was practicing, practicing, practicing for six months, and she said, I've been practicing for six months. 
my mother still hasn't changed. <laughs> you see, and then, of course, everybody laughed, and then she says, why everybody's laughing? This is a true story, you know. I've been practicing six months. She hasn't changed. So she, for her, in her life, she has been probably expecting entire her life her mother should change. I'm practicing she should change. I'm practicing for six months. By now she should definitely change. You see, but she does not recognize that. If she change and not expect her mother to change, her mother will change. So there are these little things that we have to kind of look inside ourselves more than really looking outside. And that they really help to change the situation. Okay, last one. Okay. And maybe this is taking a bit off of her question, but uh, through the practice of metta, through the practice of experiencing happiness in ourselves, uh, do you believe or does the tradition believe that that can actually create positive change uh, in the world, that it's possible to send a message of happiness or love to places that are in great pain, like Syria or Nepal? Yes, absolutely. You know, like for example, helping other people does not mean you have to suffer. Right? And sometimes people, people, it seems like, oh, in order to help somebody, I have to conf get confused. In order to help somebody, I have to suffer. No, I don't believe in that. You have to, of course, you have recognized that. Maybe some sense of, some, some, some sense of more like a, a spontaneous emotional experiences might be there, like tears might be there, or something like that. But the thoughts, like expecting something to happen, something should be like that, something sh they should not do like that. These people should do like that. I should reach that kind of outcome. And all those kind of thoughts is not the way to help. The way to help somebody is to be open to, to that people. If you're trying to help somebody, you really have to open to that person. Open means genuine open. It's not like a kind of open. <laughs> a my version of openness. No, just openness. That means you allow somebody to be what they are, and then you're trying to work with that situation because you're trying to help that person, not you're trying to help yourself. Same thing if you're feeling the pain. This is exactly what's said. You know, the way you can heal yourself is you be fully open to your own pain. Means what? Means three things. To be still, like not like interacting with your pain, body is interacting with your circumstantial pain or your, your speech internally, judging constantly that pain, just allowing it sometimes. What do you do? For example, when people come in pain, or your friend comes to you and with the pain, what do you would say? You say, okay, okay, it's okay, it's okay. Of course, you say that. We always say that. It's not okay, but we say that, right? It's okay, it's okay. What, we don't know what else to say. It's okay, don't worry about it. It's okay, everything will be fine. And you, even you say that, it helps. So even when you say that to yourself, if you're feeling pain, you're feeling challenges, just, you don't feel okay, but at least you can say, say it, it's okay. They, even those words have, will have a power, not as much when the mind participates with it, but at least that mind, has, that word has a power. You can say, it's okay, it's okay. Just sit down. It's okay. Just giving a little space, just a little space to your feeling your feeling immediately changes. So it's in, in the end, even, even the idea of helping somebody, it's, this comes from that openness. How many people like in the world, like resolving conflicts in, in the Middle East or something like that, how many people, conferences they do? How many meetings they do? There? When many times they go to do these fancy political meetings, they don't, nobody's open there. Everybody has agenda. Everybody knows what they want. And they would, nobody want to compromise. And how you can have a peace? They should not have any agenda. They should connect with each other. They should, people should connect with the heart. And when, then see what comes out of that openness. Incredible thing will come out. But if you go with the agenda, very likely a guarantee is not going to work. If you go with no agenda, it will work better. Even, even your, when you plan a day, we, know, we all have a day, day journal, right, day plan, like, you know, schedules. I always tell you, you know, you can make a day plan, but 
Just keep it in the pocket. You know, not get stuck on that. Just go out there with no plans. Just be open. But if nothing is working, then go with the plan. <laughs> but you, 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 you know, there might be much more fun things, much more creative things, much more productive things can happen without your plan. Because your plan might be constructed with your pain, body, speech, and the mind. But if you go out there without it, you might feel so much more possibilities. How many times you experience like something that you really want something to happen in your life, it didn't work out. Instead, it worked out much, much, much better. How many times? So that's the proof. But if, you, if, you, if your plan worked, you will not have what you have. Your life will not be as rich as it is. Thank God, plan didn't work. So don't get stuck with the plan too much. Even idea of helping other people, just be open. Okay? Thank you very much. Yeah.